hello welcome and good day to everyone welcome back to yet another series of the sk jarmalingam lecture series so today is a special day where our topic is about breast cancer and today's uh, topic is breast cancer and beyond and we have a very special guest today uh, professor dr ari d brooks so just to give a little bit of introduction to our professor professor dr ari d brooks specializes in breast surgery, endocrine, and oncologic surgery. With extensive experience, he has been able to provide comprehensive healthcare to patients aged 12 and above. And in leadership roles, he has served as the director of the surgical clerkship in the Prilman School of Medicine and also the director of endocrine and oncologic surgery at Pennsylvania Hospital. Uh, it has been a great pleasure and immense uh, pleasure for us to have him here today. So with all due respect, I would like to call upon Professor Dr. Ari D. Brooks to conduct his lecture. All right. So what I'm going to talk to you about today is uh, uh, the breast cancer diagnosis and management uh, pathway. Uh, and that's as I see it and as I practice it in the United States. So if you could go to the next slide. Um, I wanted to start with some disclosures. Uh, the first of all, I wanted to say that I've written it from the perspective of a medical system in North America or Europe. Um, and everything that I'm recommending or that I say that we do is evidence based. But uh, the papers that the evidence comes from are Western subjects and Western centers. And uh, I have to confess that I don't know enough about what's available, uh, what is currently done what's affordable or what's acceptable in Malaysia. So uh, we're going to actually spend a little bit of time, I hope, uh, with Dr. Rajesh uh, at the end uh, talking about uh, how we should modify uh, what I said in this talk. But, but we're going to uh, go ahead with the next slide and I'll uh, talk to you about uh, what we're going to do. So, so I did a little bit of research to see what the scope of the problem is. And then we'll talk about diagnosis, staging, uh, treatment options and adjuvant therapy. And of course, this is uh, based on my experience in the USA. Uh, and uh, so here you can see the data from Globocan uh, 2020, uh, which is the most recent data I could find for the region. Um, and um, breast cancer is the most common cancer in the world now. And uh, here in uh, Malaysia, it's the number one cause of cancer mortality for women. So uh, it is a real problem uh, and, uh, you know, a lot, a lot of uh, cancers uh, getting better. Liver cancer is no longer in the top 10 here. Uh, so you've made great progress, but uh, breast cancer is, is rising. Next slide. So um, how do we currently diagnose breast cancer in the United States? Uh, I would say the majority of breast cancers are still picked up by screening mam mammography. So using mammograms. Uh, routinely on the entire population over age 40 and at least up to age 65. Um, but uh, in the United States, there's no expiration and, and insurance will cover screening mammograms all the way as old as you'd like to be. Uh, and so screening mammograms are the basis for um, detection. Uh, and then clinical breast exam is performed in primary care and uh, gynecology offices uh, routinely uh, for uh, evaluation of the breast. Uh, the, uh, the detection uh, you know, modalities that are used, as I mentioned, clinical breast exam and mammogram. In addition, we use ultrasound, not so much for screening, but it can be used for screening. And MRI is used uh, increasingly in the United States for screening our high-risk patients, so people that uh, you know, have a gene, a BRCA uh, mutation in a, in a gene or a very strong family history or a prior diagnosis of cancer, they're going to get mammograms every year, but they might even get an MRI every year as well. Uh, you can go to the next slide. Um, you know, this, uh, hopefully you're saving this on your <clears throat> um, YouTube uh, stream. Uh, but I just put it up here to show really the overwhelming array of things that uh, we can use <clears throat> in the um, evaluation and um, management and, and uh, screening and staging and treatment 
and so you can see many columns here and and you can separate the the presentation the way a cancer is found from screening or the patient presents with a palpable mass uh, so that would be a symptomatic presentation uh, then you can have modalities for diagnosis including mammogram and mri and ultrasound and then the findings on the on the imaging can be a solid mass or calcifications and we'll look at a couple of those just briefly and then how do we do the biopsy uh, in the United States? A core biopsy, a needle biopsy is the most common, either with stereotactic guidance under a mammogram, under ultrasound guidance, even MRI guidance. So the needle biopsy should be about 90 some percent of all diagnoses of breast cancer in the United States. And then surgical biopsy, removing a lump to see what it is, that's less common, but it still uh, is a method that we use. The pathology types, of course, DCIS precancer, invasive ductal, invasive lobular, and then whether when we do the biopsy, we may find that their lymph node is involved as well. Uh, and then uh, we can classify the cancers by receptor status. Uh, we can see if the lymph nodes uh, are involved using a sentinel node exam or take out all the lymph nodes, axillary dissection. Chemotherapy, you can do it no chemo, you can do adjuvant chemo, you can do neoadjuvant chemo before, you can also do anti-estrogen therapy, which is just uh, anti-hormone uh, medications. And then the surgery types, we have lumpectomy and mastectomy, and we even have nipple sparing mastectomy, so a lot of options for surgery. And then reconstruction, there's multiple options as well. Um, and then lastly, radiation can be used, especially if we're doing bre what's called breast conservation or lumpectomy. So this is a very big array of options. And, um, you know, we can go through and select and make a decision pathway through each, ver each portion of this array for each different patient. So it's why I really enjoy managing breast cancer, because there's so many different um, options uh, as you go down this list. You can go to the next slide. Uh, just to give you an example, uh, this is a way to go through that list. It's just called a, the um, breast diagnostic algorithm. And so if you have a palpable mass, we're going to go to imaging with mammogram and ultrasound. We'll do either a fine needle aspiration or a core biopsy. Uh, and then, of course, if it's cancer, we'll go on for uh, treatment. And if it's not, we're going to follow them up with additional imaging over the next year or so. If they just have a screen detected abnormal mammogram or ultrasound and it's not palpable, we have to do what's called an image guided biopsy, either under ultrasound or a core. And then again, if it's benign, we follow that patient up with additional imaging. Otherwise we go to surgery. So um, that's just a very simple version of what you saw on the previous uh, page. You can go to the next slide. Uh, so this is just a, a very, very quick illustration of what we would see on a mammogram. So a mammogram would be two views of each breast. It's just an x-ray test. Uh, they can be very high tech with 3D uh, and, uh, you know, multiple pictures, et cetera. But the whole idea is to look for calcifications or a mass in the breast. Calcifications would not be a palpable finding and very small. As you can see here on the right, the magnified view with a circle around some small group of calcifications in the breast. And this, if it's a cancer, would either be an early stage, a you know, very small cancer or a pre-cancer ductal carcinoma in situ. So um, that's the benefit of mammography is finding things so early we can't feel them. Next slide. This one is a mammogram. You can see on the right image, uh, the uh, breast shows a, a mass they nicely, we put a little red arrow there for you, but basically you could see that even a lump that you can feel, or maybe it's so deep, even though you, it's big, you can't feel it. Uh, the mammogram shows it as a density here. So mammograms find calcifications and lumps. And this one, if it's a cancer would be, you know, still probably early stage, a stage one or two based on the size. All right, the next one. Uh, when you use ultrasound, ultrasound is a modality that um, uses sound waves to tell you really density. And so here, a nice black hole like this 
Uh, this is a cyst, so it's benign. And, and so ultrasound, if you if somebody comes to the office with a mass that you can feel, if you can just put an ultrasound on it, no mammogram is needed. If the ultrasound shows a cyst, you're done. You don't have to do anything else. Um, and if it's solid, next picture. It's a picture of a solid mass. Again, it's darker than the surrounding, but it doesn't look as clear. And so it has irregular edges and a uh, little and a little bit of shadowing but basically the the sound goes through it differently and so that's why you have this different color and it's solid and so you know this one needs a biopsy and you can put a needle in under ultrasound guidance don't need a mammogram for that either and make a diagnosis here next slide and then just a, an illustration of a couple of mri pictures very similar to the mammogram picture uh, it's black and white, and, uh, you know, the, the white can be the more dense areas, but also MRI is based on a different principle. It uses blood flow, and so the MRI uh, picture you're looking at here shows a bright white area, um, and the, the, uh, when the radiologist reads it, they can actually see through the blood flow that this is benign. It actually has, it's smooth, but also the speed of the blood going through it uh, gives you a good indication that it's not a cancer. And then the next picture shows a cancer. Also looks smooth and round, but the blood flow characteristics are different. You can't really tell that from one picture, but the radiologist can read that from the computer and tell us that this is a little scarier. It's got, uh, you know, it's pulling and deforming the skin a little bit. And this one's a cancer and definitely either needs a biopsy or surgery, of course. And uh, so we can use MRI to identify and characterize cancers as well. All right, next slide. So how do we do the biopsy? Um, like I said, the majority of cancers in the United States are going to be uh, identified by a needle. FNA is a good option, fine needle aspiration, a very good option. If you can feel a mass, just put a skinny needle in and suck out some cells and, and look under the microscope very quick way to make a diagnosis. Most of us are going to use an ultrasound guided core biopsy for palpable lumps. And that we use the ultrasound to guide the needle in because, uh, you know, we want to make sure we're getting a sample of the cancer and not the surrounding tissue. And we want to get a big enough piece. That's why we use a core biopsy. It's just a thicker needle, uh, the big enough piece so we can look at the receptor status and see what kind of cancer it is. And we'll talk about why that's important in a minute. Stereotactic biopsy just means an x-ray guided uh, biopsy. So for those tiny calcifications that you saw in the picture before, we can't feel them. We can't see them on ultrasound. So we would use the mammogram. And so here you can see an, a lady uh, laying on a table. She doesn't look very comfortable. Her breast is through the table and squished in this x-ray machine. And then that x-ray guides uh, the needle to take out the calcifications and show us you know, what was there and if it's a cancer or not. And they also can put a clip there to show us where to go. Um, the standard in, in uh, United States for excisional biopsy is, is rapidly changing. I wrote something here, it says savvy seed localized, um, but basically we put a clip in the breast. I like this savvy, which uses radar guidance, but there's radioactive seeds you can use, you know radioactive Geiger counter to find it. You can use uh, a magnetic seed and use, you know, a magnetic localizer and even a radio frequency seed using a radio frequency localizer to find the area in the breast and cut it out. And then the old way we did it, and we still do it a little bit, is with this wire. So you can see this uh, picture of a piece of tissue with a wire sticking out. The radiologist can stick a wire in the breast and show us what to remove. Um, using a wire. So um, those are all the different biopsy options. And again, we usually save the excisional biopsy for a very, very small percentage of people. All right, you can go to the next slide. So this just shows you a picture of uh, after they did the biopsy, they, they took a, a mammogram. So they probably did this biopsy under ultra. ultrasound 
and you can see all the little clip shapes there on the lower left small pick all right um i think i'm back there we go Um, so, you know, that gives you two views of the same, uh, you know, image, uh, the same breast, uh, so you can see where in the breast the, the mass is located. All right, you can go to the next slide. Uh, this is just a picture of what it looks like with the wire localization, that wire sticking out of the breast uh, under the mammogram. They can put that wire in there and then they, the lady comes to the surgery with the wire sticking out. We do the surgery using the wire to show us where the lump is located. You can go to the next picture. Um, and like I said, we're placing this. This one is the clip I use is called a savvy, but any type of localizer clip can be placed in the breast when they do the biopsy. And then I can remove it without a, a wire sticking out of the patient. And the patients like that a lot better. Uh, and it's a little bit easier even for the surgeon to do it that way. But it does add expense. All right, next one. Uh, and these are all the clips I was telling you about before, the wire, the seed that's radioactive, uh, the one I use that's radar magnetic, and the radio frequency one. So those little clips can be placed in the breast, uh, and it doesn't really matter. They all work about the same as far as uh, efficacy of finding the lump and taking it out. All right, the next uh, picture. All right, so... Um, after they do the biopsy, uh, the next step is, is staging. We want to figure out what stage the cancer is in. And why do we, you know, why do we want to know that? Why does it matter if they have a cancer diagnosis? Um, is the treatment all the same? And the answer is no, the treatment doesn't have to be the same. And so we want to know how far along this cancer is. And so, um, you know, in early stage, we don't want to do too much treatment and in an end stage, uh, we want to do the right amount. So, you know, in, in, you know, figuring out exactly where this patient is sitting so that we can uh, tailor the care for that patient. Next uh, picture. So the stages, um, uh, this is uh, the AJCC uh, staging. So it's the American Joint Commission. There's also uh, UICC for the uh, European Union. Um, and, um, this is the survival statistics uh, based on data from the U.S. And you can see, so if we find somebody with a pre-cancer, their five-year survival should be 100%. Uh, and they're going to do well no matter what we do. So we don't you know, have to be crazy aggressive for a pre-cancer or a DCIS. Stage one cancers also do very well. Um, and so they are mostly treated, can mostly be treated with a lumpectomy. Just take the tumor out and um, add radiation. And then in many stage ones, especially estrogen positives, there's no chemotherapy ever really given. Stage two are larger tumors. They can even be node positive tumors. And again, the survival of five years is excellent. Uh, and then even with metastatic disease, we have a five-year survival. It's only 22%, but it exists. There are five-year survivors for stage four cancers. And, and in breast, that number does rise uh, every year as we get better with our medications or chemo. All right, next uh, slide. Uh, how is the staging broken down uh, in AJCC? It's a lot of stuff. I won't expect anyone to memorize it. And that's why we have Google because you can look it up. Um, but basically, uh, you know, the idea is a uh, the, the T staging is has to do with the size of the tumor and the smaller tumors under two centimeters are all T1 and the larger tumors that invade the skin or the chest wall or inflammatory breast cancer we'll show you a picture at the end that's t4 so um, that's the range and the same thing with the lymph nodes going from zero to three um, and that's uh that's it and then the next slide will show you how that goes together to determine the slide the stage of a patient next slide so you can see we can group them um, to determine the stage uh, so the small cancers with no lymph nodes are going to be stage one. And then, uh, you know, the larger ones with one lymph node, small one with one lymph node is stage two, and larger one with one lymph node is stage two uh, B, uh, et cetera. So this is the basically the AJCC staging. 
Uh, next slide. The um, interesting thing about this uh, staging is that um, if we uh, look at the different types of cancer, the staging is different. So what are the different types of cancer? We're going to look at when we make our diagnosis with our biopsy, we're going to look and see what receptors are on the cancer. So if the estrogen receptor is present, that's a hormone positive breast cancer. And if it's estrogen positive, uh, progesterone, whatever, and HER2, which is the third receptor we look at, HER2 new, then that's just a hormone positive breast cancer. It's actually the majority of breast cancers we diagnose in the United States, over 60%. And those patients do great no matter what we do. And their staging is very different. It's uh, you can have positive nodes and still be a stage one. So those patients, uh, if the estrogen positive, they have a different staging. It's called prognostic staging. The HER2 uh, positive, so no estrogen receptor, no progesterone receptor, and just HER2, um, it's a totally different type of cancer. And that one, yes, it does need chemo and it uses a biologic that blocks the HER2. Uh, those patients do great now as well, but we have to give them the anti-HER2 therapy. Triple positives, this is a very rare subgroup, but they have the estrogen receptor. They also have the HER2 receptor, so we treat them with both chemotherapy and the uh, biologics. And then we use um, the anti-estrogen therapy as well. And lastly, the lowest prognosis group, the worst group is the triple negative cancers. So they don't have any of these uh, estrogen, progesterone, or HER2. Um, and now we have a biologic treatment pathway for these patients as well. Um, but they have the lower prognosis. All right, let's look at the next slide. So, um, you know, as I mentioned, the staging I showed you in the previous slide had to do with the T1 size and the lymph node negative was only stage one, but then, you know, one node positive, stage two, et cetera. The new staging is based on the, really the biology of the disease. So if it's estrogen positive, um, it's totally different. If it's estrogen negative, then it's more like the old staging. And the HER2 positive also has a uh, different staging. So I am also going to Google and looking up the stage on every patient because it changes depending on what the um, you know, receptor type is. And then really interesting, we use uh, prognostic panel testing uh, companies, Oncotype and Mammoprint are the most common, but there's others. Um, and, and they are looking at all the mutations in, in the cancer, so not like genetic, you know, inherited mutations, but um, acquired mutations in the cancer. And, and these panels can tell you if someone's high risk for recurrence or low risk. And that now is going into the staging as well. So if you have a low risk, a low score estrogen positive tumor, you can have a huge tumor and three positive nodes and still be, you know, like a stage one or at worst a 2A and do very well and have a very good survival. And if that comes back as a high risk tumor, your survival drops significantly. So we're using prognostic panel testing as part of the staging now. Um, yes, yeah, so you can see if you have a low risk test, you know, your stage one be pretty much the worst you can get. So, all right. Um, oh, I was able to advance it. That's pretty neat. Okay. So, um, what is GCIS stage zero? Uh, in the old days in the United States, before mammograms, only 3% of the cancers identified, breast cancers identified, were palpable uh, DCIS. And that, that's a tiny, tiny number. Now in the United States, 25% of all the breast cancers are actually stage zero DCIS. And that's because we have mammography and we're finding these early cancers way before they're invasive, way before they could kill anybody. Um, and so you know, management can be very different. Interestingly, for patients with DCIS in the United States, a lot of women are opting for mastectomy, removing a breast or two, because they think that they're higher risk lifetime for getting breast cancer. And they are, but they're not higher risk for dying of breast cancer. Um, but that is a big trend in the United States is mastectomy for DCIS. Um, the actual treatment for DCIS can be just wide excision, and you don't necessarily have to do radiation because, again, the survival is the same. 
but radiation does reduce recurrence of breast cancer, both invasive and precancers, if you do radiation after a lumpectomy for DCIS. Um, and so that's why in the United States, the standard is going to be um, excision with radiation. All right, next slide. Um, so what are the surgeries we offer for um, breast cancer? Um, in the United States, there's a push to try to be uh, as close to two thirds of breast cancers treated with lumpectomy or what we call breast conservation um, as much as possible. And our cancer centers really do, a, you know, monitor this rate of breast conservation. We try to do more lumpectomies uh, to more patients and the patients who are eligible or they have single tumors. Um, and if they're, you know, tumors too big or they have multiple tumors or the breast is too small, uh, then we can't offer a lumpectomy, but otherwise we're going to, we're going to offer it to everybody. And then most of the patients, we're going to tell them they really, we'd like them to add radiation therapy. Uh, finally, in the United States, we've accepted that older patients over 75 don't necessarily need radiation therapy because again, radiation therapy, not going to prolong your life. And once you're over 75, you got to die of something. And so we're not thinking that recurrence of breast cancer is going to be a, a serious problem over age 75. Um, and then the other option is mastectomy. And again, the United States trying to be about a third of our cancers, breast cancers treated with mastectomy, uh, mastectomy, removing the entire breast. Um, and, you know, we know from randomized trials, the, 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 the survival in the U.S. has been equal, whether you do a mastectomy or a lumpectomy. Um, but, you know, and a majority of my patients that choose mastectomy are choosing it, not, you know, needing it. In other words, I'm not saying you have to have a mastectomy. They're coming to me and saying that's what they would prefer. And then reconstruction, we can do reconstruction right away. That's what I do in my practice, but you don't have to. You can do reconstruction later. And a lot of patients are not uh, opting for reconstruction. It's actually a new trend for my younger patients, you know, requesting no reconstruction. Um, and there's no cancer benefit to doing reconstruction. Um, and so that's, that's okay. It's up to the patient and, and uh, they'll decide if they want that or not. Uh, next slide. Uh, so breast conservation, this is a patient who had a lumpectomy uh, and the whole idea is a wide excision and try to keep it cosmetic. Um, I actually most of the time like to put it periareolar, put my scar peri, you know, around the areola so that it's very hard to see the scar. Um, but, um, you know, the, the whole idea is to try to just preserve the breast so that the woman doesn't have a reminder all the time that she had breast cancer. So that's breast conservation. Next slide. Um, a mastectomy is to remove the breast and, and really in the United States, we're not doing radical, re removing the muscle anymore. And we're not even doing modified radical anymore in the United States. And a modified radical just means removing the breast and all the lymph nodes on that side. Now we don't do that. Most of the time we're going to just do a mastectomy, remove the breast and do a sentinel node, check some lymph nodes, but not remove all the nodes. Um, and that, you know, reduces the morbidity. Um, and again, that's a patient choice. Uh, and this is what it would look like without reconstruction. And then the next slide, uh, here's a couple of, re, you know, reconstruction options. Um, you can do a skin sparing mastectomy, which is a mastectomy with, um, you know, just an incision around, uh, the nipple and leaving, you know, taking the nipple, but just a very small scar, uh, you can, um, do, um, you know, all kinds of reconstruction. This image here, you can see a lady who underwent a um, mastectomy and then later had a flap reconstruction. So the skin and the nipple that now exist on this woman's left side are uh, moved from the belly and the nipple is created from the skin and then tattooed. So that's the reconstruction. You're rarely going to see that kind of um, size of a skin flap. Most of the time we do a very small incision, remove the nipple and then put a very little bit of skin from the belly, but we do remove the fat and, and bring that up to build the breast. So the, the areas we can get it is from the belly, uh, rectus abdominis uh, or the latissimus from the back. Those are the most common reconstructions. Next slide. Um, minimally invasive lumpectomy. You can barely see there is a scar here 
and it looks like it's on the left side of your screen there at the edge of the nipple. Next slide. Uh, reduction lumpectomy. So um, the, for a very large breast, you can remove a lot of the breast tissue, save the nipple, move it up. So give the woman a much smaller breast. This is the same woman, believe it or not, before and after and do a breast reduction. So she's much happier uh, and her back doesn't hurt, but also we didn't have to do a mastectomy on her and uh, she got uh, a lot of breast tissue removed. So that's a really good one. Next one. Um, this is called a nipple sparing mastectomy. So um, in women where the breast size is, is appropriate, we can make an incision either under the breast where those lines are drawn or at the side of the breast and remove the breast tissue, but leave the nipple areola complex. And uh, this has become a really popular reconstruction. She's very skinny. We couldn't move any fat from anywhere. So she has implant reconstruction. All right, next slide. Um, this is the one that I was telling you about where we took the, the fat from the belly. And you can see on the left side that there's a smaller incision, that skin in the middle of the circle, they haven't rebuilt her nipple yet, but that skin is from the belly and the rest of the skin is the breast. Okay, you can show the next one. And then you can tattoo the nipple back on after a mastectomy. This patient didn't want regular nipples. She wanted hearts, so she got hearts, but uh, those are tattoos. All right, the next one. Um, so an axillary dissection was the standard of care, removing all the lymph nodes under the arm. Uh, you can see this woman on the right, the, the, uh, there's a big hole um, where the skin is sucked in and there used to be fat and lymph nodes. After we remove all that, that's the way it looks. And that used to be standard. We don't do that as much. Next slide. Um, you know, the, the risks of that are injuries to the nerves, patients have numbness, they can, you know, have mess up uh, shoulder function, um, you know, and also swelling in the arm or the breast lymphedema. So, so those are the downsides and we've been trying to avoid it in the United States as much as possible. Next slide. So we, we do sentinel node biopsy now standard. You can inject blue dye. You can see this uh, image shows a little bit of blue dye there uh, on the left side, or you can use some radioactive dye. This device is a Geiger counter that we use. Uh, to see where the radioactivity went under the arm. And uh, we make a small incision, take out a couple of lymph nodes, whatever lights up. That doesn't mean it has cancer, it just means that if cancer spread, that's where it went. All right, next slide. Um, so uh, this is another uh, randomized trial. And basically it shows that uh, we have, um, you know, all these patients that were randomized where just a few lymph nodes were removed and no others either even if the cancer had positive if the lymph nodes had cancer in them the rest of the lymph nodes were not removed and they were randomized to have either removal or not and there was really no no difference in survival and no difference in local recurrence so there's no reason to remove more lymph nodes if it's just a few lymph nodes involved and and that's really become the standard in the united states we don't take out all the nodes much anymore. All right, next slide. Uh, and then what about adjuvant therapy? So I mentioned this in the very beginning, chemotherapy, anti-estrogen and radiation therapy are the adjuvants that we add and then neoadjuvant means giving it before. Uh, next slide. And uh, you can see that we use this uh, test. I wrote Oncotype DX is one of the companies that we order. And it's just a gene expression profile looking at what genes are uh, messed up in the cancer and, and then giving us a score. And if you look at this curve, um, you can see the recurrence rate. So if your score is zero, your recurrence rate is, you know, like three to 5% um, at uh, 20 years. And uh, basically, I'm sorry, at 10 years. And uh, if your score is high, like at the other end near 50, you're at 35% risk of recurrence at 10 years. And so the higher risk patients, we wanna give them adjuvant chemotherapy. Um, okay, and then you can show the next slide. Uh, so the way, uh, so this, this test was developed uh, using randomized study data, but then they did a randomized study of the test. 10,000 women were enrolled and they wanted to see if the low risk patients getting no chemo and the high risk patients, um, all getting chemo, you know, did it, did they do okay? And it was true. It validated 
that in low risk, you really don't need chemo and in high risk, you should get chemo. So that was a very good uh, validation. But what they did is look at the middle group and they saw that in the middle group, if you're under uh, age uh, 50, you don't need chemo. And so nowadays, the majority of women with estrogen positive uh, cancers, you know, we do this test and 70% of them don't even need the chemo. And that, that's been really good. Uh, okay, next slide. Um, aromatase inhibitors, this is so when I talk about anti-estrogen therapy, there's two types. The aromatase inhibitors are going to block uh, the production of estrogen in a postmenopausal woman. They won't work in a premenopausal woman because your ovaries don't use this pathway. And then the next slide, um, we can talk about uh, the SERMs, which are, you know, the one, you know, tamoxifen is the most common one. And that just blocks the estrogen receptor directly. It's an older drug and it works very well. Um, and I wouldn't say there's a huge standard in the United States. The majority of women, though, are going to get an uh, estrogen uh, aromatase inhibitor uh, if they're postmenopausal and a tamoxifen if they're premenopausal. All right, who needs adjuvant chemo? If you're estrogen positive and a high risk oncotype, you're going to get chemotherapy. Um, and you'll be treated with two or three agents. The younger women are going to get three agents, um, including adriamycin. And uh, the older women, usually just taxol and carboplatinum. And then if they're estrogen positive, they're going to get additional tamoxifen or AI. Next slide. In the HER2 positive tumors, in the U.S., really larger than two centimeters or with lymph nodes, we're going to give them chemotherapy before surgery, neoadjuvant. Um, and then any HER2 positive tumor over five millimeters is going to get adjuvant chemo. So they're not getting out of chemo if they're small. They're still getting chemo. They're just getting it after. And in the United States, we're going to use two anti-HER2 drugs uh, at the same time, uh, the original Herceptin, Trastuzumab, and then uh, what we call Progetta. Pertuzumab was added, I don't know, six, seven years ago. So they're going to get that, those plus Taxol and Carboplatinum. And then we have a uh, what's basically considered a third-line drug, TDM1, which is the Herceptin with an anti-cancer drug, DM1, attached. Uh, and this we use in uh, stage four uh, patients uh, if they fail the Herceptin alone. Next slide. For the triple negative tumors that are larger or node positive, again, we're going to give neoadjuvant chemo. Um, they're going to get pembrolizumab now because uh, the most recent randomized trial listed here, Keynote 522, showed a 40% complete response rate. All the cancer removed by chemotherapy alone before surgery. And so we use that drug for all triple negatives, um, plus taxol and carboplatinum, then adriamycin and psychophosphamide. So it's like six months of chemo before surgery. Uh, and then if there's additional cancer that we find at surgery, they're going to add an oral capecitabine. And if um, the chemo is given adjuvantly, meaning we did a smaller tumor, we didn't give them new adjuvant because they were sick, uh, they will just get adriamycin, cyclophosphamide, and taxol, which has a good response rate, but um, not as good. All right, next slide. Um, for adjuvant radiation, what do we use most commonly in the United States? External beam, photon-based. The traditional course is given five days a week for up to five to seven weeks, and that treats the whole breast and low axilla. Um, after COVID or during COVID, a lot of the radiation doctors have moved to what's called short course radiation, which is um, five days a week for three weeks, and then really short, uh, or what they say, ultra short, five days a week, two times a day, gets all the everything done within a week. It's pretty amazing. Um, and that's become very common since COVID. And, and they all did it because they wanted to get the patients out of the cancer hospitals quickly. Um, and then there's other ways to deliver radiation, brachytherapy using radiation tubes or seeds that are in the breast. You can do it as a one-time treatment uh, or, or over five days. You can do proton if you, you know, really want to. You can, you know, build a cyclotron and, and you know, spend millions and millions of dollars and use proton but in breast there's been no clinical benefit noted it's amazing for esophageal cancer and lung cancer but 
I think in breast, we don't need proton. Um, and then there's other external beam photon therapies that you can use, including um, stereotactic approaches. All right, next slide. I want to show you just, I think, two, two or three special cases, and then we're going to go talk about stuff. So basically, inflammatory breast cancer is uh, a red swollen breast here. You can see this nipple is flattened. The breast is more red than the surrounding skin. Um, there's a, what's called peau de orange, where the skin is all you know dimpled and full of uh, fluid. And there may be palpable large axillary nodes. There may not be. In these cases, you might not see much on a mammogram or an ultrasound, but you definitely want to biopsy the skin. So we do a punch biopsy of the skin to see if this cancer is involving and you know blocking the dermal lymphatics. And that's a characteristic way to diagnose inflammatory breast cancer. This is a T4 um, uh, type cancer. It's a very advanced stage cancer. And uh, all of it is treated with a neoadjuvant chemo up front. And then surgery is always um, a modified radical after, and reconstruction can or, or, or may not be done, and then radiation is always added for these patients. Next slide. Uh, and then Paget's disease, this one is, uh, you know, very hard to diagnose. It looks like a rash. Uh, you can see it goes from like a little bloody scab there on the top left to a really ugly, scaly, melted looking nipple here on the bottom. Um, and, and the only or best way to diagnose it is again, a, a skin biopsy or a punch biopsy of this nipple skin here. And what you would see is um, cancer cells actually on the skin and they're called, it's pagetoid cells. And they're basically usually associated with a DCIS that worked its way out the nipple, out the ducts of the nipple and along the skin. And, that's a rare presentation, but one that's really important because you won't see it on any screening, uh, you know, mammogram or, or ultrasound or anything like that. And it's easy to see on, on physical exam. Uh, so, you know, so when you're doing clinical exam, look at the nipple, make sure they match and that there isn't this rash or melted look. All right, next slide. Last uh, case is called cystosarcoma phylloides. It's not a sarcoma, although it's in the name. And basically, uh, it's a tumor that grows fast, usually uh, considered in the same class of tumors as what's called a fibroadenoma, a benign tumor of the breast. And all we have to do is remove it completely. You don't necessarily have to do a mastectomy to get it out. You just want to get this thing out with negative margins. We don't want to radiate it. We don't give chemo. We don't check lymph nodes but it's just got a very scary name and it does grow fast. So if you find one of those, we want to cut them out, but usually surgery is the cure. Uh, next slide, I think we might be done. Yep, we're done. And I really uh, would love to talk about all the stuff I mentioned that we do differently here in Malaysia. Yes, Prof, right, all right. So. Yeah, uh, thank you so much, Prof, for the wonderful uh, sharing session that we have had earlier. I think that was beautiful insights, especially on the diagnosis and especially on the treatment and also how we do the uh, surgical. I think the surgical options is much more advanced in the uh, United States, of course, in compared to our setting in Malaysia. So I think just to uh, to random, uh, I mean, just to start off with the entire discussion, uh, the differences that I've uh, have seen that I have noticed, I think, uh, in terms of detecting, I think yes, we still do uh, for breast cancer. I think we are going through a mammogram as the gold standard of uh, detecting care, breast cancer. And of course, uh, I mean, according to the age, we also have uh, breast ultrasound, and also right now, clinical breast examination is also uh, right now famous. I think we are trying to get that all in on, on the ground to able to detect breast cancer. I think uh, in terms of detection, I think we are still uh, on par. But uh, I did notice that I think uh, uh, in the in the context where it becomes different is that I did notice in the slide where uh, Prof mentioned on the breast management array. I think uh, there's a lot of, uh, I think where we see there's um, this receptor status and also the choice of where we decide on the adjuvant chemotherapy and the new adjuvant chemotherapy, uh, it's much advanced in the United States compared to in Malaysian settings. I think that is something that uh, very, uh, I think it's very uh, knowledgeable on that side. And 
also uh, in terms of the surgical uh, surgical uh, options, I think uh, uh, here in the Malaysian setting, I think we always go for here. Uh, we have always had a modified radical uh, excision, and also we've also had mastectomy uh, as the as the probably the gold standard of the surgical option that we have for yeah. breast cancer. But I think the reconstruction of the breast is uh, much more uh, popular in the United States, in which yeah, where I, we have seen uh, some with implants and all that, which is still uh, very lacking in the Malaysian setting. Where I think here in the in Kuala Lumpur, in Klang Valley, I think we have a few centers that do offer the services of a reconstruction surgery. But it is not, uh, I think probably like earlier we have had a discussion. So probably uh, across the street, it is probably available. But uh, talk, uh, let's talk about 100 kilometers or let's say about 30, 40 miles away from here. It's not the same. So yeah, I think that's the that's the uh, differences that actually we are trying to, you know, overcome here in the Malaysian setting. Yes. Yeah, yeah I think so that's really um, very interesting to me because, uh, you know, Yes, the standard is a modified radical mastectomy, except that is the standard up until 1986, at least in the United States. And so, you know, we, you know, we proven again in a Western population that survival is unchanged if you do a lumpectomy or a mastectomy. You don't live longer because you did a mastectomy. That being said, like I said, in the United States, mastectomy is getting very popular again. And people are really, um, you know, moving and asking for that, even though they don't, we tell them and they understand they don't need it to live longer. They want it because they're worried about a new cancer coming or something like that. And a lot of them want it because they want the reconstruction uh, and they do too. And then they don't ever have to worry about a new cancer and they can have, you know, new, new breasts or whatever. So I think that's become very popular. You know, the problem, there's two problems with, um, doing modified radical as the only treatment. The one is in lumpectomy, you need to add radiation, at least in the younger women. And in a, an area where there's not access to radiation, at least easily, or if you're working and you don't want to take the time to travel or, or move somewhere to be near radiation for a few weeks, um, that's it, it doesn't work. And so mastectomy should be the better option if you have no access to radiation. And then the other is if you're doing mastectomies and patients want reconstruction, is it covered? Can they can they afford it or does the government cover it? Or, you know, in the United States, we have a law that insurance companies have to cover reconstruction. So women, all women of all types have access to reconstruction if they want it. And that is an added expense for whoever the insurance or the government or whoever's paying and, and also an infrastructure problem because you got to get plastic surgeons now that that do that. Uh, available so so those are the two issues that i've seen right that's that's amazing actually yeah i think uh in terms of cost i think uh in malaysia of course healthcare is actually at our fingertips in which it is actually provided basically by the public hospitals in which most of the cancer patient actually uh they do their treatment and they do get their surgery done mostly in the public hospital but in terms of a reconstruction to be done, that costing, yes, I think we do not have uh, the availability of that many plastic surgeons in the first place in the country. And also to be able to do it uh, concurrently right after a, 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 a lumpectomy or a mastectomy is uh, almost impossible at our current Malaysian setting. And also, actually, to um, to uh, highlight, uh, I did notice that during your uh, your presentation, Prof. Actually, uh, I was quite interested to know about the AJCC staging update in the breast cancer, because here in Malaysia, we are still sticking with the TNM staging. Of course, yes, we do still send for the uh, ER versus the HER2 receptor and all that uh, when we actually take the sample uh, when we actually excise the cancer itself. But uh, I was quite, uh, I mean, interested to know more about the prognostic panel testing of the oncotype and also the mama print and etc. whatnot. So could you please explain a little bit more on that, uh, Prof? Yeah, so I, I don't know which version of TNM you're using, but the AJCC version 8 is the one where they have uh, the addendum, the second part. It's in the, you got to look in the appendix uh, and it's called prognostic testing. And basically... 
there instead of one table like i showed you the first table i showed you which is just you know it's a small tumor and it's lymph node negative it's you know, no don't work like that anymore now if it's her2 positive it's got its own table if it's er positive it's a different table and the prognostic testing you know mama print or oncotype is part of the staging and if they are high risk they're a higher stage and if they're low risk they're a lower stage and, and it's uh you know, and it's available, you can see it online, um, you know, in the AJCC version eight, but, um, you know, to use it, then it's another cost, right? You, you know, but, but for me, when I think about a health system trying to decide who gets treatments, right? If you had a test that could eradicate 70% of the people who need, who don't need chemo, right? In, in estrogen positive tumors, then the whoever's the payer, the government or the insurance, they would like that test. And, and that's what we saw in the United States. It's a capitalist uh, system and all of the insurance companies pay for it now because they realize it's much cheaper to do the test than to pay for chemo for people that don't need it. And so that's really, you know, what we saw. But I, I think that um, I agree. It's, it's, uh, it makes it more complicated. Um, but if you have the option, I think it's a great option to use. Yeah, exactly. I think Prof also mentioned that if, let's say, you can be a ER2 or HER2 receptor positive and still the maximum that they can go is probably at a stage 2A, which would actually have a much more better prognosis, I think. I think in that way, I think um, maybe the availability of this new staging would actually make a change in our current uh, treatment or setting, uh, of course, definitely, I think. Yeah, I, I mean, that's really... Uh a great example of uh, just changing guidelines a little bit affects, uh, you know, expenditures uh, and behavior in a huge way. So I, I think that that's one that, that you guys should look at for sure. Right. All right. Thank you so much, Prof, on that. So, Prof, um, as a strong proponent of early detection, I mean, considering the unique healthcare landscapes in Malaysia and in the United States, so how do you envision implementing and promoting early detection practices in Malaysia? Like what are the lessons or best practices from the United States do you think that can be effectively be adapted to the Malaysian context or the Malaysian setting? Yeah, I mean, it's something I, I've, I've been thinking about a lot, especially as I uh, meet more people who are in I, I wouldn't say under resourced, I'd say differently resourced environments because um, you know, the United States spends way too much money on healthcare. You know, we do, we do great, but, but I think we overspend and we do things like set up mammogram centers everywhere and require all women to get mammograms. And I think mammograms are a good way to do early detection, but I think it's a very expensive way because you not only need machines, you need radiologists to read them. And, you know, it's, it's a, it's a hard way. Are there better, are there better ways? I think there are better ways. And if we talk specifically about breast, if clinical breast exam is being done well, you'll detect the majority of the, even the relatively small, but palpable tumors, they won't be precancers. We're not going to find it much DCIS, but if we're trying to improve the overall health of a workforce, you know, a group of women who are, you know, productive, taking care of families or working or both and helping the economy, then we want to find the cancers that are early enough to matter that are, they're dangerous, but not so late that someone's going to die. And so I think clinical breast exam and, and adjuncts to clinical breast exam are, are good um, ideas. So I, you know, I think if you have a, a screening technology that, that works, including clinical breast exam, that's really the way to go. The problem is everyone's got to do it and, you know, you have to be really organized. And I've seen places where community health workers are going out to rural areas to get everybody on board and, and doing clinical breast exam out there. Sure, in this beautiful city, modern city, you've got mammogram machines all around. So I don't know that we absolutely need it here, you know, other than just getting the women to be aware. And I know that you know, the National Cancer Society is really working hard to improve awareness. If women are aware that they're at risk for breast cancer just by being a woman, hopefully they'll understand that they need to get screened, whether it's with a mammogram or exam or both, and hopefully they'll come to get it. And, and so I think that's really important as well. 
Right, exactly. I mean, that, that's very important. I think and th in terms of having mammograms available in all centers, I think that is about, I think that's a lot of uh, to talk about costs there. And uh, also, I think uh, the implementation itself, like in the Malaysian setting, we do encourage women uh, above the age of 40 and we actually limit them up to 60 to actually screen for breast yeah. cancer. I think that itself is actually a challenge in which uh, probably in the United States, we actually have uh, women who's more than 70 or 75 or 80 years old being diagnosed of breast cancer, uh, in which we are still yet to uh, target that age group, whether we do we want to screen them for breast cancer or as early as do we want to screen at the 25 years old or the 30 years old for breast cancer. So how do you think we should we should uh, you know handle this challenge here yeah, prof i i mean it's very so i'm very conflicted on this one because i mean last before i flew out here to malaysia i i was operating to get all my cases done before i leave town and one of the last ladies i operated on was um my power is going out. Sorry. Uh, one of the last ladies I operated on was 86 years old. So I don't know that I saved her life. Right. So, so why am I spending the, um, you know, all the resources to do that? So I think that's really what, uh, you know, that's part of the problem. Also, you know, you mentioned it, if you only screen from 40 to 60, hopefully you get the majority of the population that's number one at risk and number two working and contributing to the economy. So if the government is, trying to decide how to spend money. I understand that. That makes a lot of sense to me. Obviously, as a voter, once I turn 61, I'm mad because I want to still be screened and I don't want to die of breast cancer. So I think, you know, politicians are going to have our time with that. Exactly. Exactly. I think that is that is one of the biggest challenges that we have right now. Even some of our local programs here only uh, recognizes those to actually, those are actually eligible to go for these uh, free screenings within the age of 40 to 59, where when you turn 60, you're not, no longer eligible and you have to request for, request for different type of fundings or you have to be self-funded to actually screen yourself for breast cancer. I think that is also one of the most important things that we should highlight in this context, I think, yeah. So also, Prof, yeah, yeah, yes, yes, Prof. Sorry, I was just gonna, one more comment on that. The United States doesn't have public insurance until age 65. So in the United States, after age 65, you have public insurance. Um, it's a cultural decision as a country that they made, I guess, in the 40s. Yeah, I guess it's the late 40s, early 50s, that we need to, it's Social Security, we need to take care of our people as they retire. They've worked hard all their lives, and now they retire, we're going to give them health care. But we didn't, as a country, decide that it's important to keep our younger people healthy so we don't give them coverage by the government it's all private insurance coverage so um it just shows you that each country has to decide culturally what they you know how they want to spend their government money because it's hard to do it all right i think end of the day they are looking at the productivity of the of the citizens in the main as the main context and i think uh when we look at uh, right now i think in this current era people i mean we have the population has been skewed towards the geriatric population at the current era i think where there's more people who are actually living more than the age of 75 and 80 and whatnot even in malaysia i think we have a, a huge group of uh, geriatrics where uh, we are also opening a few centers for ger gerontology and i think that's also important so uh, looking into that moving forward so prof um how do you uh, approach the development of any personalized treatment plans for breast cancer patients like considering factors such as the genetic predisposition and also individualized risk assessment i mean how do you go about it yeah those are great questions i left that out of the talk entirely on purpose because i don't know what i just don't know what the risks are here um like for instance brca1 and brca2 are very common mutations that we find in the United States. And we even know the ethnicities and religions that are most common to carry that. But I have no idea in Asia, let alone Malaysia, what are like, what if there's equivalent gene, probably there isn't for breast because the risk is, is not, it's half at most in the worst country as far as risk for breast cancer in Asia, 
it's half the risk in the United States. So probably there isn't that, but I don't know, you could probably help me with that. Right. Actually, we do have the uh, genetic predisposition where we actually have uh, those. I mean, in our population, BRCA1 and BRCA2 detection is becoming famous as well. I think it's also popular because there are. Uh, th it is also one of the risk of getting breast cancer. And we have identified uh, as one of the main uh, risk of breast cancer. But of course, as a multiracial country, it also different. Uh, it also differs among our ethnic groups where we have the uh, Chinese, we have the Malay, and we have the Indians, in which we do notice that it is actually more common among the Chinese to have the BRCA1 and BRCA2 gene. Right. So there's that is also one of the identified risk uh, that we notice for breast cancer among our Malaysian community. Yeah. Yeah. And I, you know, and the, the other thing that we think about is why is breast cancer risk rising in some countries? many, almost all countries. Um, and the other risk factors that we talk about when we do risk counseling for our patients. So if you're a primary care or GYN doctor and you're talking to a woman and she wants to understand her risk of breast cancer, you can ask for family history. And that's a risk if you have, you know, one a mother or a mother and a sister, that's like very high risk lifetime, like 33% if you have two first degree relatives. But probably not going to find that much over here that you have two first degree relatives. You might have an aunt or like a distant whatever that has breast or ovarian cancer. That's a risk, but not that high. So that's one. But number two is uh, how old were you when you started having periods? Right. You ask that question. Right. Then you say, how old were you when you had your first baby? So the period of time from first period to first baby is a period of time when you had periods regularly with a very high estrogen progesterone exposure with you know then a turnover in the breast and then the next month again and then every month no baby so if you're 30 or older when you had that first baby and you were 12 when you started having periods it's 18 years of uninterrupted cycles it's a lot of turnover in the breast and so that's a risk factor for breast cancer so when we think about why are some areas some countries developing higher rates of breast cancer probably because women are number one they're you know, as children, they're having better nutrition. So they're ready. They're, you know, maybe starting their periods earlier. Number two, they're going, getting education and getting jobs and being, you know, unbelievably, you know, productive. They're not stopping to have a baby necessarily till they're 30 or whatever. And so you have that increased risk that maybe in a country that, you know, if you got pregnant when you were 14, you didn't have that um, exposure to risk. But is there a way that the government or a policy or anybody fixes it? Better not. I wouldn't mess with that at all. I think, you, you know, it's okay. It's the risk. You know, it's it's the risk and it's okay. It's a, a part of that success of a country is having the entire workforce being productive. And, you know, yeah, we'll take that risk of breast cancer, but we're not going to lose that many people. We're doing well and we'll continue to do well as long as we find them. All right. Okay. Thank you so much, Prof, for that uh wonderful insight on the risk factors and the risk assessment for the breast cancer patients. Um, also, I think one of my last questions for today would be like, um, so what are the challenges do you perceive in the current breast cancer care? And also how can our healthcare system and communities address these challenges to improve overall pa patient care, Prof? I mean, there are, there's so many challenges when you take care of somebody with cancer. You know that obviously very well because the, you know, the Cancer Society is working on all those angles, right? I mean, there's, right. of course, there's this, the psychological problem of, you know, dealing with a life-threatening or potentially life-ending disease. There's the financial toxicity of having to, like, give up your job or move from your home and go get treatment. There's um, toxicity of treatment, obviously, so medical problems that occur. Uh, you know, there's so many things that come with it, and that's why, you know, you need a strong cancer society to, to, and cancer hospitals that can handle those things. Um, but I think that really uh, public awareness, again, I'm going to get back to it again. I keep saying it because I think that you, people have to understand they can talk about it. They, you know, can help each other with it. They, you know, can help guide other people to get early detection, et cetera. And those are things where the community comes together and supports the, you know, the cancer patient and 
improves the outcome for future cancer patients. So I think those are those are the things that that the that can be done as a community. Uh, and and of course, you know, you're this you guys are doing everything right. It's just has to be spread and you know that we have to overcome barriers. We have the, the same and even different barriers in the United States. And you know, even though we have access to all those things, not all patients have access to all those things and not all patients have the same outcomes in our country. So it's it's the same everywhere. All right. Yep. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much, Prof, uh, for the wonderful input on that, on the challenges and all that.